I love cosmology. Oh, cosmetology, like hair and makeup. Not quite. Cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole, of its origin, its development, and its eventual fate. It involves astrophysics, particle physics, astronomy, not astrology. I'm a Scorpio, but that's beside the point. Cosmology gives us the ultimate bird's eye view. When I'm stressing about a problem set, sometimes I just step back and think about how insignificant it is in the grand scheme of the cosmos. Carl Sagan, the physics icon, summed this up, saying, think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors, so that, in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Thinking about these great countries as fractions of a dot is really good at putting the universe in perspective. Cosmology is something that I love, but a lot of other people are scared of it. When I tell them I study physics, some people look at me like I'm an alien. Their eyes glaze over and they mutter something about never getting physics, all those equations. You must be so smart. Where does this fear of physics come from? Why do so many people have these preconceived notions about physics? This fear prevents us from understanding some of the most incredible pieces of knowledge that humankind holds. This fear prevents us from having this cosmic perspective that we so often desperately need here on Earth. So I want to start out with a little quiz. But don't worry, I'm not going to test you on facts or stats. I want to know how much you think that we know and don't know about the universe. Have we as a species figured out the answers to these questions? Ready? All right, here's the first question. Do we know how old the universe is? Raise your hand if you think yes. All right, raise your hand if you think no. OK, awesome. So the answer is yes. Isn't that crazy? From our vantage point here on this little planet called Earth in what we call 2016, we've been able to figure out how old the entire universe is. We know this from looking out at galaxies like these. This is a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, the highest resolution image of a slice of our universe. We were looking at these galaxies, and we noticed something strange. They're all moving away from us. This has to mean that the universe is expanding. The space between the galaxies is increasing. This mysterious force that's causing the universe to expand is known as dark energy, but this is just a name. We don't know what it is. So what we can do is wind time backwards and think about all these galaxies coming and converging into a single point. And this is the Big Bang, the origin of the universe. And we can calculate, based on the rate of expansion, that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. For some scale, if we were to scale down the history of the universe so far to a 24-hour clock, all of modern human history, the last 20,000 years, would span less than one-tenth of one second. All right, next question. Do we know how big the universe is? Raise your hand for yes. All right, raise your hand for no. All right, awesome. But this one's a little trickier, so the answer is no. We don't know how big the entire universe is. We don't even know if it's finite or infinite. We don't know if we're one of many universes, a multiverse. But we do know how big the observable universe is. There's a limit to how far we can see because there's a limit to how fast light can travel, the cosmic speed limit. And light has only had 13.8 billion years to reach us. So what we can do is uh, calculate how long the light has taken and taking into account the rate of expansion because the galaxies were originally much closer to us we can figure out that the observable universe is 46 billion light years in radius. And because of this finite speed of light, when we're looking at distant objects, we're actually looking back in time, as these objects were maybe billions of years ago. So because the, universe is, the observable universe is defined by how far we can see, we're actually each at the center of our own observable universe. Let me show you. This is Calvin and Hobbes in the universe, and they're each sitting in a sphere at the center of their unobservable universe. Calvin in the white line defines his sphere, and Hobbes in the orange line. The light from the edge of Calvin's observable universe 
is one foot further out than Hobbes. So he has access to a foot more of the universe than Hobbes does because the light from the edge of his observable universe has just had time to reach him and no further. But before you get too full of yourself about being at the center of the universe and all, let me give you some scale. If you were to scale down the observable universe to the size of the Earth, then the Earth would be smaller than a proton. So there's a lot that we do know about the universe. We know how old it is. We know how, how big the observable part of it is. And there's a lot we don't know. We don't know how big the extent of the entire universe is. We actually don't even know what the majority of the universe is made of. Let's zoom into one of these galaxies. The galaxy is spinning, but it's spinning too fast. If we count up the amount of matter that we see from the starlight, there's just not enough to hold the galaxy together. Imagine you're a kid on one of those spinning merry-go-rounds in the playground. If you're not heavy enough and it's spinning too fast, you'll go flying off. There's not enough mass in this galaxy for it to hold together. Its stars should be flung out of it. What's holding it together? This missing mass is known as dark matter, and it makes up 85% of the matter in the universe. This is what I've been trying to research for the past couple of years, trying to shine some light on what this dark matter is, so to speak. Let's zoom out again. This is a simulation of a box of the universe. Each yellow dot is a galaxy, and the pink are simulated dark matter fragments. But these are actually invisible. We can't see them in the real universe. But we do observe their gravitational pull. This pull is so strong that it arranges the galaxies into this cosmic web. This is what the universe looks like on large scales. This is our bird's eye view of the universe. So I pose these questions like I did because I think what's important is not that you've memorized the facts and the stats, but that you have an idea of the general boundaries of human knowledge. So why might some people not know where these boundaries lie? I'm sure you all could sketch out a map of the US and a basic timeline of American history. So why might some people not be able to do the same for the universe? I thought about this question while I was doing computational cosmology research at the Museum, Museum of Natural History in New York City last summer. During breaks from sitting at my laptop analyzing simulations of the universe like this one, I watched swarms of school children excitedly explore the halls full of great blue whales and T-Rex skeletons. They would sneak touches of the do not touch meteorite and watch the planetarium show with awe. Most importantly, they would constantly ask questions. When did we lose this curiosity? When did we decide that we had maxed out on the amount we could understand about the universe? For a while, I lost it too. If you had told me in 11th grade physics that I was going to pursue a career as a physicist, I wouldn't have believed you. For me, physics evoked old dead white men scientists and blackboards full of incomprehensible equations. Actually, I found that these are some of the main reasons for our collective fear of physics. Let's talk about those old dead white men. This dominant picture of what a physicist looks like makes people who don't fit that picture feel like physics isn't for them. Pop culture perpetuates this idea. For instance, the stereotypical characters in the show The Big Bang Theory. My high school physics class had an even gender ratio. But I will graduate from Brown this spring with only five other women out of around 30 of us. I've had only one woman phys physics professor throughout my time at Brown. And these numbers are pretty standard across the country. Women received only 20% of bachelor's degrees in physics in 2013 and held only 8% of faculty positions. And this is not just due to women having less interest in physics, as one of my male peers told me. I can't speak from the experiences for those from other marginalized groups, but the statistics are just as, if not more, alarming. Students from underrepresented minority groups earn fewer than 10% of bachelor's degrees in physics in 2013. And these numbers steadily decline along the academic pipeline, looking at PhDs earned, postdocs held, and faculty positions held. This skewed attrition rate for women and minorities in physics is indicative of the systemic biases that pervade the field. 
These are just a few statistics, but it's clear that many other factors, including sexual identity, class background, ability, all can be huge barriers to feeling like a part of the physics community. And feeling like an outsider is scary. The homogeneity of the physics field makes it, perpetuates the sphere of physics. We can all be aware of the biases we hold about who looks like a physicist. They're not all old dead white men. And we can consciously work towards combating these as well as the systemic biases in the field. All right, so let's talk about those blackboards full of equations. Makes you think that all physicists must be geniuses, right? I promise you, we're not. And this is not only an inaccurate idea, it can also be really discouraging. For instance, my best friend freshman year was at a party, and someone she was interested in asked her what she was studying. And she said, physics. And they said, you're too smart for me, and walked away. <laughs> and this is not just an isolated incident. I and many of my peers have experienced these kind of biases and assumptions. But this idea of having a fixed growth mindset when it comes to physics, the idea that you're either inherently good at it or you're not, isn't accurate. Research has shown that students who are conditioned to have a growth mindset, who are taught that they can improve, do better on physics exams than students with a fixed growth mindset across the board. But unfortunately, the phys physics classroom often doesn't cultivate this mindset. If your physics background is from a traditional high school physics curriculum or from a college pre-med class, these can be, let's face it, kind of boring. Sure, Newton's laws and electrical circuits are really important and can be really interesting, but they don't showcase the bigger picture. They don't show the exciting new discoveries. But even if these discoveries aren't in the physics classroom, they're all around us. Take some of the recent high-profile discoveries in the field, such as the Higgs boson in 2012, the particle that gives everything mass, and the Pluto flyby last July when we took the first ever close-up picture of the X planet, and the first ever detection of gravitational waves last month, where we, are, we were able to directly detect ripples in the fabric of space-time. These are incredible discoveries at the cutting edge of modern physics, and sure, the people working towards these discoveries had advanced backgrounds in mathematics and computation, like the equations on those blackboards. But the ideas that this research conveys are surprisingly comprehensible. There were loads of scientists and journalists racing to explain these ideas for a broad audience when these discoveries occurred. Learning about these discoveries can be a great opportunity for working towards getting over the sphere of physics. Next time you hear about a big thing happening in the field, read about it. Ask a physicist about it. Even ask Siri. When you meet a physicist, ask them what they do. And then listen. Just don't space out. <laughs> to borrow a phrase from one of my favorite sci-fi novels, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, don't panic. Just as we should all be informed citizens of our countries, we should be informed citizens of the universe. We should take the initiative to learn our domestic affairs, the fundamental components that make up the universe, and our foreign relations, where we stand in the context of the universe. Thank you.